It's my pleasure to introduce one of my favorite nonprofit leaders to moderate and lead this discussion. Uh, TVNPA, former board chair and executive director of the Kirk Georgie Foundation. Please help me welcome Carolyn Sigrid to get this program started. Thank you, Kathy. It's uh, wonderful to be back, back here in person and seeing so many familiar faces and hopefully lots of familiar faces online as well. So I'm going to start with introducing our uh, kind of distinguished panel, and I'll start with Jay Ingram, who is joining us virtually. So Jay is a Recreation Manager of Human Services with the City of Pleasanton Library and Recreation Department. Jay has worked in this capacity for five years. Part of his responsibilities is working with the many Tri-Valley Human Services nonprofit organizations. This work is focused on annual grant funds authorized by the City Council with the intent to help our local nonprofit human services providers build capacity to serve Tri-Valley residents with a variety of needs. During the pandemic, Jay was able to work alongside many service providers, all of whom filled very important gaps in human services. While the pandemic has been challenging for everyone, Jay has drawn strength from watching local nonprofits work effectively and efficiently with each other for a common goal. Jay has worked in municipal government for over 30 years, mostly in the parks and recreation field. Prior to working with the city of Pleasanton, Jay was with the Parks and Recreation Director for the town of Moraga for 10 years. Prior to that, 14 years working in three cities in Marin County. Uh, please welcome us here on stage. Share uh, Sharon Sue or Share, as everybody knows her. Uh, oh, Award-winning poems have appeared in literary journals and anthologies, including Arcanus Review, The Gathering, Joys of the Table, an anthology of culinary verse, and Blackbird as Sun, the California Poets on Crows and Ravens. Her first book, In My Other Life, is a collection of original poems and paintings, and it was released in 2010 by Richard Resources Publishing. Her most recent book, the Magician's Wife was published in 2018, also by Richard Resources. She studied with Santa Cruz poet Ellen Bass for two years and has participated in workshops with Stephen Dunn, Tony Hoagland, Marie Howe, Dorian Lowe, and other distinguished poets. She was Poet Laureate of Livermore from 2009 through 2013 and has served on the Livermore Commission of, for the Arts since 2014. So next is Susan Hayes. Uh, Susan has, oh, so welcome, Cher, sorry. Uh, Susan has enjoyed 25 consecutive years of community involvement in the Tri-Valley, dedicating time as a volunteer, a board member to over 20 regional organizations and civic communities. She spent the first six years of her professional life as a paralegal, eventually moving into journalism, where she spent 12 years, nine of which was as the weekly columnist for around Pleasanton for Bay Area News Group. For the past 15 years, she's worked in nonprofit management as coordinator of the Tri-Valley Educational Collaborative, auction coordinator for Auction Napa Valley 2012, executive director of Pleasanton Partners and Education Foundation, and interim director of the California Main Street Alliance. She presently runs her own nonprofit and communications consultancy. We can see why. Uh, in 20, she was the 2019 recipient of the Pleasanton Chambers Individual Community Service Award. Susan is completing her second four-year term on the Pleasanton Human Services Commission, serves on the boards of the Pleasanton Chamber of Commerce Foundation and Pleasanton Adult and Career School. In 2010, or excuse me, in 2020, Susan founded the Tri Valley Nonprofit Fund for COVID Relief with Kathy Young um, to support our nonprofits in the area. Susan holds a BA in political science from UC Davis and an MS in organizational development from USF, uh, 
resident of Pleasanton since 1991. She is a proud mom of two young adults, Sarah and Grant, and a spunky Jack Russell Terry mix. Res Welcome, Susan. Michelle Walker Wade, and she is the Community Relations Specialist in the Communications and Marketing Department with Sandia National Laboratories in Livermore. Michelle joined Sandia in April 2022 to focus on building, cultivating, and strengthening Sandia's relationships with surrounding communities, local and regional leaders, educators, civic groups, business organizations, and nonprofits in the area of educational success and family stability. Notable projects in Michelle's center include analyzing and revamping the corporate contribution priorities, reconnecting with the Livermore and Tri-Valley area partners, and launching a new grant program, hopefully some of you applied, called Success in Climate Change Education for K-12 Youth. Prior to join, joining Sandia, Michelle spent 23 years as a program manager and public educator in adult and career technical education, where she excelled in educational leadership, building programs with partnerships and collaborations, securing funding for educational programs, marketing and outreach, career pathways, and school accreditation evaluations. As a full-time educator, Michelle served on the following boards, the Western Association of Schools and Colleges, Southern Alameda County Consortium for Adult Education and Mid Alameda County Consortium for Adult Education. She also owns a small business in the finance sector and is president of a nonprofit organization. Michelle has a bachelor's degree in liberal studies and business communications from Old Names University in Oakland and a master's degree in organization leadership some tree, from Tribeca Nazarene University. Please welcome Michelle. And up next is Jack, and Jack Mahoney is the Director of Management and Power Building at the Silicon Valley Community Foundation. He joined the foundation in early 2018. Since joining the foundation, Jack has spearheaded several civic engagement initiatives across the organization. He has led the foundation's support to implement California's Voter Choice Act in Silicon Valley and work with government partners in the city of San Jose, San Mateo County to establish voter engagement funds. Jack believes it is vital to support BIPOC leaders in order to advance systematic change and build long-term power in communities of color. He looks forward to engaging in that work through his leadership of Silicon Valley Community Foundation's movement and grant-making strategy. Early in his career, Jack worked as an organizer across the country and brings lessons from his experience into his work today. More recently, Jack worked in the intergenerational, international, excuse me, development field of good governance. He spent over five years at the Open Government Partnership, an international initiative started by the Obama administration to bring governments and civic society together to build more transparent, accountable, and participatory institutions. He held a variety of roles at OGP, rising to become a program officer focused on supporting governments in the Asia Pacific region. Jack holds an MS in public management and government from the London School of Economics and a BS in religious studies and political science from Santa Clara University. Go Broncos. <laughs> Jack. Sure. Right, this is a question for all the panelists, just kind of an executive, executive overview of the organization, how long you've been around, who you fund, and how much you fund. So uh, actually, I'm going to start with Jay. All right. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Yep. All yes, right. we can hear you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for having me. I'll try and be brief. I wrote down some notes. Uh, the city of Pleasanton was incorporated in 1894, but I don't think that was the gist of your question. Um, so the, uh, the Housing and Human Services grant program was offered, it's been offered by the city since I'm going to say around 2000. So about 20, 20 years is the Housing and Human Services grants program. 
the areas of focus that the Housing and Human Services Grant Program focuses on for giving is disability services and access, food and nutrition, healthcare and behavioral health, homelessness specific to the Tri-Valley, senior services, um, critical initiatives uh, that pop up in the Tri-Valley, uh, mostly built around infrastructure that's needed, uh, workforce development, unemployment, and then youth services. That's mostly the human services area. Then we have a housing area, which includes focusing on programs such as housing re re rehabilitation, um, housing counseling, rent subsidies, and supporting independent living skills. Um, and then we also have a community grants program, which focuses on civic arts, and then a youth, uh, youth services program that's kind of run through the youth commission. And each of those, the civic arts and youth uh, services grants are $40,000 each. So $80,000 for the community grants annually that the city set, sets aside um, in general fund dollars. Our coverage area is mostly Pleasanton um, with a broader focus on the Tri-Valley. Um, our typical size of our community grants, um, we usually give out between four and $5,000 for community grants. Um, and the cap for community grants on the ask is $7,500. Human services grants, the amounts range from about $4,000 to $200,000. Um, and we have a variety of different buckets of funds that we pull from um, um, for to fund the program. And the housing grants typically range from about $15,000 to about $95,000 per year. So our total, what we call housing and human services grants and community grant budget typically ends up with an ask of city council of just over a million dollars every year. The council has to approve that uh, that allocation and I'll probably get into some more details and some future questions, but that's a high level overview. Great, thank you very much, Jay. So lots of funding opportunities. Hopefully everybody took note of that or goes to the Pleasanton website, the city of Pleasanton website. Okay, share, how about for the Commission of the Arts? So um, the Commission of the Arts actually uh, has been around about 20 years, something like that. It actually started with a citizens group um, that put together a proposal called Arts Alive. It's a plan that um, had a vision for making Livermore more inclusive and, and accepting and hospitable for the arts. And that the commission was, uh, was formed after that sometime in the early, um, early 2000s. Um, the commission does not create art. The commission uh, has a budget that comes from a portion of, of fees that are paid by developers whenever they develop a project, including if the city develops a project. So there's a portion of the fees um, and that goes to the arts programs. And then we give out uh, program grants, um, grants for uh, public art. Sometimes this, the commission will, uh, for example, just yesterday I was at the installation at, at a wonderful new sculpture. In Springtown at the Bright Noble Commission said, okay, we're going to uh, do sculptures throughout the town, not just downtown, but everywhere. And this was the first of those projects. We put out a call to artists, and then we got dozens and dozens of applications and selected one. Um, so the, and then we also have grant programs. Uh, we have many grants that we do every quarter, and those are those are modest grants, some somewhere up to fifteen hundred dollars or so. Uh, for artists and, and art related groups who have uh, a, a project that they need some assistance with. For example, I believe that we gave a uh, mini grant um, uh, for there's some, some artwork some, at the uh, Bothwell, and uh, they had come to us and they wanted a, a grant for that. Um, we also give larger grants twice a year which are project and program grants, those go up to $10,000 and can, can 
usually up to ten thousand dollars. We I was at the opera last weekend, and I know that we have given grants to the opera sometimes for their uh, programs in schools, sometimes for special programs that they have. For example, um, we gave a grant to Art Walk, which was also last weekend, and um, those are the kinds of things. So it can be it can be actual programs, or it can be um, pieces of standing art. For example, all the murals that you see in town, most of those. Some of those we did individually, and some of them we did uh, through a group that's put on um, uh, mural a couple of years. That's mostly what we do. Okay, thank you, Sherry. And Susan. So, welcome everyone. Thanks so much for having me. Um, the Tri Valley Nonprofit Alliance has been around, as most of you probably know, since 2014. Um, the Tri Valley Nonprofit Fund came up in the early days of the pandemic uh, to support um, six safety net service providers that were um, struggling to scale to meet the really quickly escalating needs that we were all having here in the Tri Valley. Um, and we did that in coordination with CHEF, the uh, Community Health and Education Foundation. So that was Tri-Valley Nonprofit Fund 1.0. We raised $183,000 um, and were able to give about $60,000 um, or $30,000 to each of those uh, six organizations. So we wanted to continue the program. And so now we have Tri-Valley Nonprofit Fund 2.0. And that is a grant program. And we wanted to broaden the scope. And so it's any kind of nonprofit that serves the Tri-Valley. It offers unrestricted funds for immediate use. And um, the idea is that those funds have immediate impact and that there are measurable results. Those are really the kind of the three concepts that we operate under. Um, we have a budget of $100,000 a year, um, and we give these out quarterly. So we're in the middle. We, we just... Um, completed our third quarter. Um, our fourth round is coming up and that will end um, the end of November. So um, we've been really excited about the variety of nonprofits that apply, particularly because we want every quarter to offer a well-balanced portfolio. The Tri-Valley Nonprofit Alliance is about being inclusive. And so our idea is to make sure that um, we touch as many areas of the community as we can. Um, grants are up to $5,000. Um, and the grant committee is comprised of members of the community, members from the um, Tri-Valley Nonprofit Alliance leadership, and um, donors. And um, we have had, gosh, at this point, we're about with, with the $25,000 a quarter, we're able to give out of about approximately 10, 8 to 10 quarter. But this, for two of our quarters, we've received over 40 applications. So we know that the need is there for um, unrestricted immediate funding. And we're working to raise as much money as we can to do that. All right, thank you, Susan. And Michelle for Sandia, the grant making. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm from Sandia National Laboratories here in Livermore. And Sandia has been in existence nationally. Uh, we're, we're going to be celebrating 75 years next month, next year, rather. Uh, so we've been in existence since 1945. Our headquarters is in uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico. We've been here in Livermore since 1956. Our community involvement uh, program, it's a corporate community involvement program. Our focus areas are family stability, which includes things like housing, um, food instability, and uh, crisis prevention for families. And uh, we also focus on education success, and it's education success for K-12 youth is what our focus is. Uh, we emphasize STEM, of course, because we are a technology company. Uh, so we do emphasize STEM, but that doesn't mean we don't fund other types of projects and programs within the education stability space. Um, for education programs, we're looking at out of school programs, after school programs, summer programs, intercession type programs, so not actually in the classroom. For our funding, although we'll, we can send volunteers into classrooms uh, for special projects and special events, but in terms of our funding, it is for after school, out of school, summer 
intersection type program. Um, our coverage area is Livermore and, and out, and it really depends on where reside. We try and be in the communities where I'm starting from Livermore, going out into Alameda County. At this point, we're about as north as Berkeley Avenue and about as south as Fremont in terms of funding. We may do volunteer projects further out, but in terms of funding for uh, projects and programs, that's where we are in Alameda County. And in South San Joaquin County, uh, we're from Mountain House to as far as uh, Stockton, but closer to the Lathrop side of Stockton, not too far deep in Stockton. As you get closer to Lodi, we have fewer members of our workforce that way. So we're a little bit closer in um, for South San Joaquin County. And then starting this year, uh, we're expanding into East Contra Costa County, which would be cities like Brentwood, Discovery Bay, and Antioch. As an organization, Sandia nationwide, our philanthropy budget is 1.4 million. And the funds are allocated from there based on where the members of our workforce live. So with Livermore being uh, not as large as uh, Albuquerque in terms of the size of our workforce, our, our um, budget for California is 175,000. So our typical grant size from there is 8,000 to 10,000, some smaller, some larger. It really just depends on um, not just your project or your program, but how well Sandia members of the workforce can engage with the program. If it's a project that I can't see opportunities for us engaging and volunteering and mentoring and things like that, um, the funding amount may be a little bit lower, but for projects that we can really engage in, the funding amount may be a little bit higher. During COVID, we did fund certain things a little bit higher in the family stability area, just because the need was so great. But as we come out of COVID, we're kind of pulling away from some of those family stability funds and redirecting those funds back to education. Um, our grant cycles are two times a year. We have one in January and one in June. Um, but this year, we added a special, uh, just in the Livermore area, a special third cycle for the climate change education grants, but they're smaller grants. $500 to $3,000, and they're really for projects. And the deadline for that is coming up later this month. And um, so I'm looking for, you know, projects for 12 years to get them engaged and involved and taking a deeper dive in climate change. All right, thank you, Michelle and Jack for Silicon Valley Community Foundation. Yeah, and I should, I should thank you all for inviting me here. It's nice to be in a place where the fog burns off before lunch, <laughs> finally. But um, so as, as um, Carolyn said, I'm Jack Moni from Silicon Valley Community Foundation. Um, I should begin by saying that, you know, our community foundation uh, serves Santa Clara and San Mateo counties. So most of you will not be able to get funding from our institutional endowment, but we had discussed me kind of providing some information about community foundations in general, especially because lucky for you, you have one that's starting here in your region, which I think is, is such a wonderful thing. Um, our community foundation, like most community foundations, goes through a process of defining its um, focus areas based on what the community and so in our we ran a one-year community engagement process that covered the length of Silicon Valley and reached so many different communities and of course the issue areas that we ended up with are ones that you hear Michelle talking about other areas around the, um, the Bay Area you know the cost of living is the primary issue right so housing and homelessness uh, early child uh, early childhood education um, in financial stability or uh, ac access to economic justice. And then I lead another strategy, um, which Carolyn described um, uh, earlier, which is, is our movement and power building strategy. The idea behind that being, you know, we need uh, within our region policies that are uh, driven by the community members that are most impacted by them, right? So we need transit policy that's driven by bus riders. We need a uh, housing policy that's directed by folks who are experiencing homelessness. Um, our community foundation, uh, also, like other community foundations, does have uh, donor advised funds. And so we actually have quite a few donors that have been with the community foundation, um, in some cases, you know, for multiple decades, in some cases for just a few months. Uh, but they're, they're giving directed by the donors. We like to say that, you know, it's our role to put community back in community foundation. And so it's been our North Star to get 
more of our donors to focus on giving locally. Um, these numbers are, are significant, but um, it's the Community Foundation, SVCF, has an institutional endowment uh, that allows us to do about $15 million of annual grant making, but our donors have $2 billion in annual grant making. Of, of that, about $423 million is within the Bay Area. Um, so as you can imagine, a lot of our donors are interested in issues like climate change, um, you know, or like uh, rare diseases, or, you know, and, and the, the, those institutions that are receiving those funds may May be located outside the Bay Area. Um, but it's really important for us as a community foundation to ensure that as many of those of, of those grants can be directed back uh, into our community. And so we have a platform that I know East Bay Community Foundation and San Francisco Foundation, which do serve your region, use, which is called Just Fund. Um, and the idea there being that uh, organizations within the region can upload a project or more information about their organization that the donors can then access. So if you have a donor, for example, that's interested in climate, instead of writing a check to uh, an organization in Washington, D.C., they're writing a, a check to an organization that's locally working uh, to uh, ensure that the climate crisis is uh, not being felt as severely within our communities. Um, I know for our region, for example, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a particularly big issue. So we focus a lot of our attention on uh, driving our donors to give locally in areas where there's high need, East San Jose, East Palo Alto, Daly City, uh, and other communities. Um, uh, I think I answered all your questions. Yeah, I, I think remember. you did. <laughs> <laughs> One right. quick point of clarification. So even for your, so you fund in the Silicon Valley, for the donors who maintain donor advice funds with you, is that also still within the uh, Silicon or within the Silicon Valley or so that could be outside. Exactly, it could be outside. So our donors, you know, most of them uh, opened their funds when they were, uh, you know, experiencing a kind of, um, I don't know how to say this but delicately, like an increase in their net worth at some point. Um, but uh, you would think I'd be practiced at this, but uh, no, but uh, so many of those donors come from the tech industry or the sort of real estate property development industry. But many of them have moved, right? You know, they're, they're, they may have retired. Uh, in fact, I was just talking yesterday to a donor who uh, spent 50 years living in Palo Alto, still cares about the Palo Alto community and the, and the Silicon Valley. So, so yes, our donors do not necessarily have to live in our region, uh, but many, in fact, most do. So then they've talked about how much, all of the panelists have talked about how much money is awarded and in what capacities. Uh, Jay, if you could start with then, so how do people apply for grants and do these outside resources like Five Star and that process for reviewing grants? All right, so logistically, uh, the city of Pleasanton for our uh, housing and human services and community grants, we all use Zoom grants, which is another online platform I'm not familiar with GuideStar, um, so I can't say if it's uh, the same or similar, but uh, we use Zoom grants. We've used Zoom grants successfully since 2011. Um, we do have a specific time period. Our grants work on the fiscal year. So logistically, the grant applications um, window opens typically the last one or two days of November or the first two days in December this year they release on um, December 2nd. We do have a mandatory um, workshop uh, that's on the 7th of December from 10 to noon, it's gonna be virtual. And then the application timeframe closes the, uh, next year, January 20th of 2023. So it's about 45, 46 or seven days that applicants have an opportunity to fill out the application on Zoom grants. Don't need a letter of invitation, but you must attend the workshop in order to apply for the funds. And the workshop is, um, is uh, will cover grants for the city of Dublin, from the city of Livermore, and from the city of Pleasanton. So it's a beneficial workshop to make uh, if you can, um, if you're planning on applying for funds. A lot of organizations apply for funds in more than just one city, more than just Pleasanton, and that's a possibility as well. Um, once submitted, there's no need to follow up. Um, staff will reach out if we have questions um, from the applicants. The question was asked how to make your grant stand out. Um, I think for Pleasanton specifically, you make your grant stand out by serving high numbers of Pleasanton residents. And we, we really focus on our the, the lowest of the income levels within the Tri-Valley. 
So high numbers serving, you know, the mo those most in need um, will will stand out. Um, a little bit about the process: our human services commissioners, all seven of them, rank all of the twenty or so applications um, individually, and then once they do the individual, in and out. Uh, I'm sorry. You're cutting in and out here. Would it be better if his video is off to get him, or is that on our end? Uh, it's mainly on our end. Okay. All right. Sorry to interrupt. Go ahead, Jay. Okay. Um, so um, the commissioners evaluate the all the twenty applications or so individually, and then they get put together. Staff evaluates the the um, individual applications as well, and then brings forward a recommendation to the Human Services Commission every March. Um, part of that evaluation process is the three cities, Dublin, Pleasanton, and Livermore, working together to figure out which um, areas of need are being covered. Hopefully, all of the areas of need are being covered within the Tri Valley, um, and so we address that. There's an extra layer of the evaluation process. But it's very inclusive with Dublin and and Livermore in our case. So, um, and then actually, when the commission, then the commission has this discussion, you know, kind of in an open forum, not kind of, but in an open forum at their March commission meeting, saying, you know, because there's a recommendation of which organizations should get how much money based on the limited amount of funds that we have, and then the commission makes a recommendation to the city council. Then the city council usually approves it in April of every year for the next upcoming fiscal year, which is July 1 to June 30th of the coming year. Right, so it sounds like it's an annual cycle. And if you're eligible, attend that meeting. And I'm sure that date, do you have a date for that real quick, Jay? Is that Yes, online? that date, that date, and I put my information in the chat is December 7th. It's virtual from 10 a.m. to 12 noon. Um, if you're interested, contact me and I can send you the link to it when we get to, when we start advertising for it. Okay, so December, get your grants in by January, uh, make sure you read all, all the application. All right, Cher, what is your process? So uh, we have two basic processes. So the process for um, both the mini grants and um, projects and program grants, uh, you go through the city website, Similar to what Jay was talking about, because we are part of the city of Livermore, where commissioners are all appointed by uh, the city council. Um, so you go through the city website, um, and uh, there, the city promotes the um, the applications period. So we have deadlines for the many grants four times a year: March, June, September, um, December first. And March 1st and September 1st. And um, and you apply through the city, there's a there's a, um, a connection to a, a website where you can apply online. You can also contact city, one of the city administrators in the um, economic development department and get a paper application if you want to and submit it that way. Uh, but most people choose to do it online, I believe. And then those projects that uh, the commission uh, comes up with. So for example, I was talking about the, the sculptures before. If the commission decides, all right, we're going to do this, and it's not another group coming to us, then we put out a call to artists, and those artists apply for those grants through um, Cafe Art, which is, so that's basically visual art, um, that they would apply for that there, and that way, uh, the commissioners can actually see the art that's being proposed for the site, and um, and we can go through all the applications that way. All right, thank you. And then Susan, how about for the so the Tri Valley Nonprofit Fund applications are online and they are submitted online as well. So you work with in that program um, that's that's um, housed on our website. Um, open to any organizations, as I mentioned, that are nonprofits in the Tri Valley or serving the Tri Valley. So you don't necessarily have to have your organization be housed here as long as you are serving a portion of our communities. Um, you must be a 501c3 or have a fiscal sponsor, um, which is really great because that way we've been getting a lot of these newer nonprofits that we have no idea even were existing. 
So um, it's been a really fun way actually for all of us. Who said, oh, we, gosh, we know so much about what's going on. There's so much we don't know. So it's been a really exciting opportunity for these newer nonprofits to jump in and try to scale to become really established. Um, the review committee, as I mentioned, is comprised of representatives from the organization, from the community, and from our donors. Um, because of the um, number, the volume of, of grants we've been getting, um, several grants are randomly assigned to everyone, um, but everyone gets copies of all the grants. So the review process is, is comprehensive. Um, we meet several times. And... Um, and we disperse the funds, um, $25,000 a quarter. At least that's been our goal this year, and we are on it so far. Um, and we do that at the end of each quarter. And then um, our fourth quarter just opened October 1st. So we've already got a number of organizations coming in uh, with their applications. So we're very excited to see what the next group is going to um, bring. We look for, again, immediate impact, measurable results, and serving our Tri Valley community. All right, and then Shelly talked a little, briefly about the process for Sandia. We uh, were to add the time frame. You have one grant you're looking for this month, right? Yes. Yeah, so our you can access our our grant application and grant information on sandiagives.gov. I'm sorry, sandia.gov under the about page. There's a link for community involvement there. It's a PDF download, and you type in your responses to the PDF, save it and send it back to us. Uh, the timeline is right there in the grant information. Uh, there's no need to contact us in between. Um, we pretty much stick to the to the timeline as much as possible. If not, we'll send out an email and say what the, what the changes are. Uh, and you make your grant stand out by fully and completely answering the questions, but being concise. Um, and if you are a returning grantee, making sure you have sent in your report from the previous grant cycle. <laughs> the hard part. Yeah. All right, and then Jack, you're to, uh, your process is not from this area, but just yeah. anything else in general to add for, about how grants are done? Yeah, I, I mean, I think this is true of a lot of community foundations that there's sort of a mix that, you know, we do some grants that are off cycle and sort of just, you know, come directly to an organization, but we do have our fee processes that are open throughout the year. Um, in different issue areas. So if you do know any Silicon Valley nonprofits or you happen to work also in Silicon Valley, um, please check our website uh, and that's siliconvalleycf.org slash grants. Um, but we, uh, you know, as I think Michelle and Susan mentioned, I mean, the biggest thing for us is just whether or not you respond to the questions. Um, it's, it's well, how often that doesn't happen, but um, but it's, uh, you know, we've, um, and ask applicants also, you know, how difficult did you find this application? So we're always trying to improve. And I think, honestly, the community foundation field as a whole is moving in this direction. And towards more general operating support grants away from project moving. really kind of, you know, employ the, the principles. And so this year we rolled out office hours for the first time where folks can log on and ask us any question that they might have. Um, that's been really helpful. It's stuff we filled up our calendars quite a bit, but, you know, it's it's really, it's clearly making a difference in terms of the applications that we're getting. So, um, yeah, I hope that helps. All right. So there's a lot of dates and deadlines. It's like I say to high school students applying for scholarships and colleges, make your lists, complete your applications and submit them on time. So uh, Susan, uh, with your background in uh, journalism and wide ranging uh, nonprofit organizations, storytelling is really kind of a hot topic these days. Do you have an example of that or the benefits of that? I do. And I have to say, when you're sitting next to Cheryl Wooler, who is such a celebrated poet in the area, and I started in the poetry community long ago, and when I sat down, I was like, so um, I may give her at the end or a few words of wisdom from you. So just now I may throw it to you if I have time. Um, so your 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 storytelling, um, as I'm sure all the other panelists can also allude to, it's what differentiates you. It's the essence, it's the heart of your organization. Um, it's what draw draws people to you. And so what you want to do is you want to be able to convey that in a way that draws funders to you, right? So there are a lot of different elements that you want to have in there. Um, 
it's your we story. It's not your I story. Um, it's it it's begins with your origin, but it ends with your vision. So when you're crafting them, you're going to have your overall general one, which is which are talking points that all of the people in your organization should have, so they can all always be people who can share the story. But when you're applying for a grant, there are also ways to couch it um, in a way that will really speak to your audience. And so before you actually adjust it, you want to learn about your target foundation. You want to go to their site, look at the language that they use, um, look at what they value, look for cues, look for their tone, um, and then craft your adjusted story with those things in mind. Um, and then keep in mind your target audience. It's a person. People will be reading this. You know, you may have a medical um, nonprofit and you may be applying to a medical foundation. So, of course, you're going to want to use technical terms so they know that you really understand the space. But remember, many of these people are people. And so tell your story like you would tell it to anyone sitting in your living room or on your Zoom call. Um, examples, using specific examples. Um, that really um, illustrate how your work is making a difference. Um, and you don't have to, um, as, as Jeff was saying, as we've all said, you know, the, the applications are getting much more concise. You don't need a lot. You just need one really powerful example. Um, and that really helps them relate to what you're trying to accomplish. Um, and then connect your project to their mission. Um, even with a word, even with a phrase, um, just so that they can read that and, and the light bulb will go on and they'll go, okay, I get this. I want to read more. I want to learn more. We want to really look at this organization seriously. Um, and then your organizational origins. If you're a new nonprofit, a lot of your people in your, or in your um, organization, maybe your founding board members or your founders, they have been here a lot longer than the organization has. And so they can really help you put it in the perspective of the whole community. So ask around within your organization too for um, high points on, on the story that you're going to tell about your organization. Um, share. What in the world did I forget? I'm sure uh, I forgot. I, no, I, think, I, think you, uh, I think you explained it very well. Thank you. I feel like I got an A. <laughs> Thank you. And then I did yeah. Yeah, so Jay, do you have any kind of closing comments? I know you have to run with uh, all of the responsible for it. So. Yeah, let me just, just thank you very much for being accommodating. I apologize for this. Um, I do want to say that our grant process with the city of Pleasanton um, has very limited dollars. Uh, the city of Pleasanton does take great pride in setting aside general fund dollars. We use, I spoke earlier about different buckets of funds. We use a dedicated amount of general fund dollars, um, CDBG, community development block grant dollars, which are federal funds, home funds and low-income housing funds to make up that 1.1 or $1.3 million worth of funds that we grant on an annual basis. Um, our process does have a lot of repeat um, grant requests, um, organizations. Um, it's, it's pretty difficult to break in because of the limited amount of funds. Um, but I would say to that, please, please, please don't get discouraged. Um, I've talked to a couple of organizations over the years that didn't get anything or got less than they got the year before. And we have an open and honest conversation about what I think they could do to improve for next year. And that's worked well for a number of organizations that come back for year two. And the commission decides to recommend to give them some funds. Um, but in that year that after they didn't get awarded funds, they still continue to track information of Pleasanton, Ple Pleasantonian serve um, and continue to serve Pleasanton residents. So they can come back and say, hey, we didn't get funds the previous year. We're back again this year. We still continue to serve you know, this many Pleasanton residents. Um, and I will say it's important to track um, the number of people um, that you serve specifically in Pleasanton and the Tri-Valley and their demographics. Um, that's a big portion of a lot of our questions that we ask to kind of target you are, you know, providing services for um, the low income um, residents in our community. Um, um, let's see. It's, yeah, willing for open and honest conversations because uh, we want as many organizations to build capacity um, because 
the organizations in our community are the ones that are boots on the ground that can provide those direct level of services that the city can't. Um, and if you don't get, you know, recommended for funding, absolutely. I'm open for conversations going forward. Um, and I'll end by saying I, there was uh, any final advice to the audience. Um, keep up the great work of those organizations that are serving the Tri-Valley or considering serving the Tri-Valley. Um, what's unique about the Tri-Valley in my perspective and being local government for over 30 years is that the nonprofits really stand up and lift up the Tri-Valley. And without the Tri-Valley, the cities of Dublin, Livermore, and Pleasanton couldn't make a dent in all the sweat equity that you put into it. And so it's the least amount that the city of Pleasanton can do um, to give a million dollars every year to help the nonprofits. Um, we would give more if we could. The grant program is a valued program for our city. Our council loves it. Um, and our commissioners work very hard at allocating, you know, the limited amount of funds every year going forward. So Please, you know, contact me if you're considering applying or just go ahead and apply. I can give you the information for the um, December 7th um, workshop. Other than that, I will uh, say thank you very much for your time. All right, thank you very much, Jay. I can hear a lot of the same language that even Susan said with the storytelling. You websites carefully. Right, so make sure you know how to do that applying. But uh, I will kind of echo what he said. It's the nonprofits that lift up the community and the cities value that. So make sure to uh, check out all of those websites. So a big part of this, and now Michelle's gonna answer this. So she doesn't have power, we'll move the camera onto her. And that's so Michelle, part, a lot of grants applications talk about budgets. So how do you analyze budgets? Do you just look at the bottom line? Do you want details? Um, advice on the, that difficult portion sometimes. Um, I want some degree of detail, but not too much. Uh, really what I'm looking to see is, number one is, is your budget for your organization realistic? And then is your for this project realistic. I'm also looking to see and an impact of a dollar isn't always in numbers. Uh, it, you know, if you serve 100 versus 10, it really depends on the project and it really depends on who you're working with. If you're working with hard to serve students, those dollars don't go as far as, as your top scholars. So, you know, I look at that when it, when it comes to impact, I'm sorry, when it comes to budget, um, I, I look at just like the quality of the dollar amounts you're giving me. And again, do they look realistic? Have you really thought through this budget? Um, can you sustain your program and the project based on what you're, what you're pro projecting? Um, so I look for that. Um, when it comes to, and that's in the application, but then there's the report time. The report then says, okay, this is what we projected, but this is what we spent. And this is how the money was allocated. And they don't have to be the same because a lot of times what you, what you that's why it's a production, you really don't know. And so then we look to see what, what happened um, and how was the impact? How was the money spent? Um, did you stay within the guidelines of Sandia? Let's say you had to do something a little bit different, that would be okay. But did you spend outside of our guidelines? Did you, you know, I kind of look for that as well. Um, I do look at stories. I'd rather see stories in the reports. I'd rather see stories all along them. Um, I don't want to read stories at application time. You know, I want to know the story. This is personal, probably. I want to know the story all along. Tell me what, you know, shoot me, shoot, shoot me short little pictures or stories or something, not long stories. Um, <laughs> during during the, the process. And so we can see where things are going and how, and I can celebrate with you all along. Um, that's kind of something I look for and it does impact what I think about when I'm considering the budget uh, on, the, on the back end. If you've spent prior year's money very, very well, I probably will do a little bit higher on next year's grant. Um, 
you know, it just really just depends. So that's kind of what I look for when it comes um, to budget. Something else that's not regarding budget, but it is regarding your status. I do check statuses <laughs> with the Secretary of State to make sure you are still in good standing with Secretary of State. All right, make sure you get all those filings done on time. All right, and then share so a grant is awarded. How do you like to be stewarded? Talk a little bit about stewardship. Part of the, the contract that, that uh, established when you accept a grant from the city is that you will acknowledge the city in your in your program or uh, depending on what it is. You know, if it's uh, usually a lot of times they're programs. So uh, if Shakespeare, for example, is doing a play, because I know we have, we have given to this trauma vicious organization. Um, Generally, they, they have programs with the paper programs that they hand out and the city is thanked in there. And the last time I went to a play, uh, someone stood up at the, I don't remember, it was the beginning or the end or the middle of the play and, uh, and thanked all of the various sponsors, including the city of Livermore. Um, and that's the typical way that, that we like to be thanked. If it's a, um, if it's a set of murals that are going up, for example, it is a little, little trickier, but usually there's something underneath the, the artist's signature uh, that thanks the city of Livermore. Uh, the commission has recently been talking about the fact that the funds come from the city and the city is who should be thanked. We really, really like it when people thank the city of Livermore uh, through a, a grant from the Commission for the Arts not because the Commission for the Arts wants credit for it, but because we wanna make sure everybody knows who we are and that this is what we do. Uh, because unfortunately, there are still many folks in, in our community who don't even know that we have a Commission for the Arts or what it is that we do or that their organization or their um, artistic brainstorm might, um, might be able to apply for, for some funding. Uh, so we do like to get the word out every way we can. Um, usually organizations, when they are doing their advertising ahead of time, however they do that, they will talk about their sponsors, and we expect to be included in that. And we do watch that. If, if we've uh, given a grant and um, that organization really hasn't done a good job of, of um thanking the city or mentioning that the funds, part of the funds came from the city. The next time they come back, we're gonna have a conversation about that. Um, not necessarily that we would say no, but we're gonna have a serious conversation because that's that's part of the agreement that they have. All right, so uh, Jack, we talked about uh, collaboration and telling stories of working together. Can you talk about how funders look at collaboration between nonprofit organizations? Yeah, absolutely. I think I think for community foundations, it's it's really important. I mean, for our community foundation, it's it's extraordinarily important. We um, recognize that you know to achieve collective impact, right, to really kind of move the needle on an issue, it requires a, a broad coalition or a broad set of groups that are working together towards the same goal. And so, uh, it's actually one of the six or seven questions that we have in our application is how are you collaborating with other organizations. Um, and, you know, sometimes organizations say to us, we don't feel collaboration is necessary. And given the project, sometimes we agree. Um, but often, you know, we really appreciate learning about how a collaboration has developed and strengthened both organizations. Um, right. So, for example, uh, you know, we had uh, one of our, our grantee partners um, run a climate summit for San Mateo County recently. And, you know, their organization is based in a sort of kind of more like um, a more wealthy area of San Mateo County, and they were interested in certain as aspects of the climate crisis, but then we wanted them to connect with organizations that were experiencing sea level rise in their communities or uh, experiencing heat waves where and, and folks couldn't afford air conditioning, for example. And so by partnering with other organizations, um, different communities, communities of color, they were able to really put together a summit that I think, you know, achieved a success for a broader community and not just their own. Um, and that's so important to us as a community foundation, seeing that organizations are working together to achieve that collective impact. So I think that that, and that can be part of your storytelling, letting organizations know about what you're doing throughout the year, not just. 
So I want to make sure that we have some time for questions. So um, first we'll go, are there any questions that came from chat? Okay, Abby. So Shana is actually asking, uh, um, she says, I'm hearing a lot about grants for the provision of direct services. I'm with a capacity org that would like to support many of the organizations doing great work uh, in the East Bay and Tri-Valley. What does the panel see as available for organizations like Center for Excellence in Nonprofits? All right, so for, uh, in case everybody didn't hear that, kind of what if you're, you are an organization like uh, CEN or Tri-Valley Nonprofit Alliance or just capacity building in general, how do the panelists see that and funding? Um, Jack, you mentioned that that's kind of shifting at least from community foundation. About for the other organizations, is there a shift to kind of capacity building and supporting organizations that help in capacity building as opposed to as opposed to specific programs? I don't know. Do any of the other panelists, Michelle? Do you have uh, in in certain ways? Um, I would say yes, and it really for for Sandy, it depends on the project. If the project meets the guidelines. Uh, and a nonprofit 501c3 is you know, applying for them within those guidelines. Um, I, I, yes, I would say so, that I could see that working. Um, but again, it's just really gotta meet our tight guidelines for family stability or uh, education success for K-12. Right, and I don't think that's really applicable to the uh, commission for the parks. Right. Uh, and Susan, how about just some general capacity building? I think you said for the Tri Valley Nonprofit Fund. Well, I think capacity building, <laughs> if you're talking about, um, well, there are a lot of different types of capacity building. The type that I had referred to earlier had to do with um, smaller nonprofits that hadn't actually built capacity yet. Um, and so for, for those, I think the best way to build capacity if you're a very small or, or emerging nonprofit is to make sure that you have a working board that's committed and that is highly skills-based, the skills and experience that you need, because they're gonna be actually creating the operations. Um, at a certain point, you'll get to the point where it's time to um, actually hire staff, but until then, you have to have a really broad range of highly skilled people on your board. Um, and so, you know, you may, not everyone comes to the board from their heart, right? Um, many people do, the founders usually do, but there's other people around you that can really help you um, become more established. And I think an excellent example of this is Sunflower Hill. If you're familiar with that organization, when they first started, they were a very, very, very committed working board, and they had skills and experience and, and professional levels that really helped them create this really this community um, for uh, for developmentally disabled adults. And once they got to a certain point, though, they needed operations people. That's when they started hiring. But they also knew exactly what they were hiring for because they had done the work. So I think that kind of a tight beginning is really what helped. Spell capacity. All right. I have a follow up, but I'll just give a shout out to so you need to go back to Mark and make sure that you stay leadership council. They'll help you find those, those skilled board members, even if there's a fit there. So, go back. Um, so, then, Jack, how do, do you have any suggestions for organizations that are looking for capacity building or that do capacity building themselves? places to look for grants, types of organizations to look for grants. Yeah, and I would say this is, I think for a lot of community foundations, right, our mandate is to ensure the, the well-being of the nonprofit community within our region, right? So this is a huge priority for us. Um, you know, we do have grant making specifically for capacity building, but I think like a, a lot of other nonprofits, we also have platforms that different nonpro nonprofit uh, partners or different nonprofit Profits can log into and access uh, help and services. And I think many of them, you can get a sponsorship from you know, a funder uh, if you have one. So the biggest two that come to mind are Catchifier, um, which is a platform that you can, um, I don't know if that's familiar to anyone here, but you can sort of upload something you need help with. So like if you need a website, if you need help learning QuickBooks, so you can do budgeting. Um, that's where you can get uh, volunteer professionals from around the world that will help you, mostly in the US, that will help you 
whatever the need you have. Um, and then there's another platform that we use, which is called Resilia. Um, that's R-E-S-I-L-I-A. I hope I spelled that right. My colleague will not be happy if I didn't. Um, but that's a platform to, um, which is more specific to nonprofit needs and nonprofit skills-based uh, services. And that also, I think, you get access through. Uh, a um, so it, it's possible that, you know, the East Bay Community Foundation or San Francisco Foundation or some other funders that you might have in this region might uh, kind of sponsor your, your participation in the use of those two platforms. All right. How about questions from the audience? Is there anybody who wants to speak? Then we'll come to Susan. So I was curious. What's how do you all view the role of or the place of overhead in project budgets? Because all right. I'm going to repeat that for the people on Zoom. So how do you view the role of overhead as you're looking at budgets and evaluating evaluating applications? So that was embedded in the overall organization. Your overhead and stable other other stable funding sources um, because for, for our budgets they're pro more project and program so we can't sustain your organization so i'm, I'm hoping i'm answering the question yeah I, that's not quite what i meant okay but thank you um what i meant more was because i wasn't good at saying it um in order to run a good program you need to have the rest of the organization so overhead a con contribution to organizational overhead so that way you can accomplish the programmatic goals. I guess in this question, maybe I might rephrase this a Thank little you. bit, is do you um, have a certain number you look for that you expect to be spent on overhead or if there's a lot of discussion in philanthropy and, and for grant makers to really realize organizations can't run without overhead. And um, do you allow, or what is your realistic expectation or your expectation, sorry, I'm a little biased there, your expectation <laughs> about how much needs to be spent on overhead to make, have a viable organization? I'm going to take this because that is exactly how the Tri Valley Nonprofit Fund was, was founded. Um, the, a lot of organizations get their overhead from their big fundraisers every year. And of course, with COVID, that was impossible. Um, and yet the need was growing exponentially and there were very little funds for these really important city partners like Jay was talking about um, to, to scale, to help meet that. So um, that's why we, um, we designed it with um, unrestricted funding so it can be used for, for operations. And that's why our current 2.0 of the Tri-Valley Nonprofit Fund is unrestricted because we, we understand the need to have that structure in place in order to execute the program. Right, anybody, uh, hold on, we had a question over here first. Any other comments from any of the panelists? So I just want to say with the, with the commission, it's a little different because um, as you were saying with San Diego, there are funding programs and, and um, projects. So we are looking at, looking at the funding for that particular event or that particular project. And uh, when we do look at, does it seem realistic? We also look at, um, do they have uh, other funders? So we like to see partnerships besides us in the community. So if we get an application that comes in and they're asking for a certain amount of money from us, we, we like to see at least 50% coming from someplace else. Um, another grant or contributions from members or a fundraiser that they did, uh, where you, we're seeing the community buying in. These are taxpayer dollars that are going out, and we like to see that the um, project that we are funding support. It doesn't have to be you know, everyone in the community, but um, at, at least a, a large enough group that, um, that this is something that the community wants to see. So I'm hearing kind of two things there is you need to do, apply multiple places for funding. Some funding may be restricted to programs and there's a greater, greater number of funding sources that are for overhead and kind of capacity building. So really make sure you're investigating all of those uh, sources of funding. So Susan, and then I think we had a question. Good morning, thank you. My question is for Michelle at Sandia. And you mentioned that you're doing just after school or summer school STEM and climate grants. Wondered if you could expound on that a little bit more and, and have you thought about doing 
teacher pro, uh, professional development or classroom mini grants in those areas. All right, I'm gonna repeat the question for the people on Zoom. And that was, uh, Susan was asking about for Sandia is doing after school and summer programs direct on climate. Are they also considered doing kind of teacher education? So I did like to say teacher education. That is one of the, one of the things that uh, we will uh, allow our funds to be used for as well. As far as in the classroom at uh, expenses, it can work. The classroom teacher would need to partner with the nonprofit organization. We would fund the nonprofit organization to come into your classroom during class time, but not directly to the school. So those are one of those important things to know the distinction of. And then I think you had a question and then Kelly. Yeah, so I, you know, I've been in a nonprofit space for a long time as well. So I, I, one of the greatest needs that we see is that uh, um, when you look at, there's so many amazing, first of all, there's so many amazing people doing great things and just uh, purely from the heart, right? When we start the nonprofit you know, to fill in the needs where the government cannot do. But one of the greatest needs is about, uh, know that from the larger organization is there a shift when we think about needs the greatest needs is actually the capacity building so we could build the organization the organization itself would excel in the long run and doing more great work to serve the community and the people that needs the help so i'm you know my question would be for the larger organization is that is there a shift or have we thought about shifting towards the, the help out with the capacity building all right i'll summarize that quickly. So for the larger organizations, I think Jack, you kind of mentioned that. What is the trend for shifting to supporting capacity building? Uh, Jack, if you since you're yeah, the largest I think, at the table here. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, I, I think it's a it's a it's a fundamental part of trust-based philanthropy, right? Uh, you know, and I think you see a lot of institutional funders moving in that direction, a lot of family foundations in particular. Um, with I mean, I can speak from, from the perspective of our donor advised funds. You know, every time a donor comes to us with a request, we assume it is a general operating support request unless they tell us otherwise. And if they say, you know, they want this to make a project grant or whatever, you know, we that organizations have. And so try to work in overhead or money for salaries or other kind of expenses that are necessary to running a, a nonprofit organization. I think that's happening, particularly within the Bay Area, but you know, within the country as a whole, um, this, this kind of trend towards recognizing that. So that's that's a good trend that's happening. And that's good news for all of you in the room. And then Kelly, you had a question. So we're on the opposite end. You know, we, have, we don't have a grant making process yet. We're going to develop it by Michael Swen, which is another thing. And, um, and for the question, could be for some of the nonprofits of what they like about the processes and what has been onerous. But one, one factor that some agencies have done that I've been researching, they include either like an interview or possible uh, presentation and in order to get a better feel for it, like the Valley Impact. And I just don't know if, if any of you have done that and or something like that involves instead of only paper. And also my other question on that would be, is there something you have modified in your process over the years that you've been doing it where you thought Right, that it just you know, discourage people or all right. So, we're going to kind of summarize that question. Our Zoom audience, it is online application, the paper application that gets submitted, and what role that is, and then what are other things that you to improve your efficiency and effectiveness? Uh, is there something that you've done recently? Any of you have experience with that, Chair? So one of the things that we do is we develop developers are required to either pay into the arts fund or to um, create create their own art project for every development that's put in. And if they just decide to put in their own, um, they bring those projects to us and they usually do a presentation and, and we look at those and decide if they're uh, appropriate and you know up to our standards and meeting the criteria and so forth. That being said, people who come uh, or organizations who come to us for uh, project and program grants doesn't happen with the mini grants, but occasionally with the larger grants, 
an organization uh, will want to do a presentation. Um, as a um, city mission, we have at, at the our meetings, there's a um, an open time. And quite often, uh, the leadership of organizations will come in connection with uh, an application that, that's being put in, and they'll give a small presentation. Sometimes they have video, sometimes they're just speaking. It's pretty impactful, I will say, and it gives us an opportunity to ask questions. Um, if something doesn't seem like it's going to quite gel, we have the opportunity to say, well, would you consider it do doing it this way? Um, I, I think it can be an advantage, but it's not a requirement. So um, I think some of the more savvy um, uh, grant applicants uh, do that sometimes. All right, and then it, it, you, any of you left with the last 30 minutes, second response to that, and then I can invite Kathy back up. From a corporate contributions perspective, um, I can see that it's very time consuming for us, quite honestly. And um, it, it, it would probably make it so that we review even fewer applications just because of the time commitment it would take um, just on a grant cycle when we still have all of our other community work that we are, are doing um, instead of being out interacting with some youth office um, reviewing applications. And so when I weigh out which one is from a corporate contribution of our corporate with the community as opposed to invest that type of time into the application process. All right, thank you, Michelle. And I think Michelle brought up a very important point is that the one thing that's uh, limited for all of us and finite for all of us is time. So we kind of have to keep that in mind as well. So I'm going to invite Kathy up to thank our wonderful panelists or invite you also to. Right, for those on Zoom, Kathy's hand giving out thank you. So we have some closing remarks as well, Kathy. Oh, yeah. You're okay. Your patience as we work out all these little bugs with our hybrid systems. But um, I want to thank everybody who showed up today. I want to definitely thank our panel and our moderator, Carolyn. I want to thank Lyle, our tech person who had to deal with all this, and also the main theater. So uh, again, remind you of the power of giving that's coming up on November 16th. We want to celebrate all the wonderful nonprofits in our area and also the Tri-Valley Nonprofit Fund. We, this fund exists because we have lots of community members giving a smaller amount. And so right now, you make a donation on the chef's site, your gift will be matched by 150%. And then that will enable us to continue to offer this fund. So that said, there was my little pitch. Thank you all for being here.